I'm preaching in my series on restoration, which I'm going to conclude next Sunday. I'm preaching, last week I preached about the restoration of walls, and then today I'm preaching about the restoration of gates, and then next Sunday I'll preach on the restoration of altars, and that'll be the conclusion of this series. Two weeks from today I'm going to launch a series entitled Reversing the Curse. God, God spoke to me this morning. I mean, God spoke to me this morning about this. And <clears throat> we're going to dive into some things that have to do with what the enemy meant for evil. God has turned it to good. You're going to begin to see some things in your own life that, well, you haven't understood them. You don't know why they've happened. And I'm going to give you some eye-opening truths and some revelation that's going to give you faith to see the curse reversed. And that's all I really need to say about that right now because uh, my time's a little limited here today. But in the third chapter of Acts in the 21st verse, it says, whom the heavens must receive until the period of the restoration of all things, which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times, whom the heavens must receive until the period of the restoration of all things which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Father, anoint every ear to hear, every mind to perceive, and every heart to believe. In the name of Jesus, anoint me to articulate revelation to your sons and daughters in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I believe this with my whole heart that before the second coming of the Lord, there will be a miraculous revival, for lack of a better term, on the face of this earth that will sovereignly activate the restoration of all things. I don't believe the Lord is coming after a dysfunctional church. I believe he's coming after a glorious church. But for him to receive unto himself the church that is a fit bride for the Savior, there is going to have to be a move of God on earth that brings about a restoration. <clears throat> I've talked to you in this series about a restoration of joy, restoration of health, restoration of years, restoration of finances, and I've been talking the, uh, over the last week, I started last week about the restoration of walls, gates, and then concluding with altars. And I want you to, I want you to really listen to me on this <clears throat> because we have accepted an inferior perspective on what the church should be. And I do believe that the reason people are becoming progressively disinterested in church is because there's no real reason to be interested. I mean, we keep, we keep preaching elementary level sermons to people with postgraduate degrees, and we're trying to keep it so simple that to me it's insulting to the intelligence of the listener and I believe that it's time for men of God to rise up and really roll up their sleeves a little bit and challenge the sons and daughters of God to be more than what they are. We have, we have turned the church into this Ronald McDonald drive through And now, because our services have no snap, crackle, or pop, people get bored very quickly and very easily. And so they're looking at their watch at 15, 20 minutes, wondering how much longer they have to be there. No wonder people don't attend. On average, people attend church once a month or every six weeks to where it used to be a weekly discipline. <clears throat> so you say, what, what are you saying with all that? I understand why it's happening. But I do understand something, that when God's power and when the gifts of the Holy Ghost and when the supernatural of God begins to flow, things begin to happen that will draw people through the doors of the house of God and will cause them to rise up and surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Pastor Aaron was just in India. Uh, there's no telling how many different gods they pray to in 
over three million different gods that they pray to in the country of India. I remember my father preaching in Japan and he was so, uh, being primarily in the American culture, most of his ministry, he went to Japan one time. And in that time, it was an eye-opening experience because he put it this way, they've got gods for everything. And so my dad has this audience, this audience out there and most of them were unbelievers. And so he sees on the second row a woman that was totally blind. And he walks down the aisle and he curses the blindness and God completely restored her sight instantly. He stepped back with his six foot, nearly six foot five frame and silver gray hair. And he looked at an audience of people that had no telling how many gods. And he said, my God just opened her blind eyes. Can your gods do that? And all of a sudden the altars filled and hundreds of people received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. We've been trying to figure out how to reach people. This is not what God's called us to do. This is not a strategic research class. What God has called us to do is let the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost speak for itself. And when it speaks, it will draw people who are sick, who are depressed, who do not have health, who do not have finances, that do not have joy, etc., etc., etc. But all of a sudden, when they find that in the power and in the presence of God, the burdens can be removed and the yokes can be destroyed, that is the restoring of things. And when people get restored, they will serve God with a fervency and with all of their heart. How many of you have had some miracles in your life that you realize God has restored some things or God has put some things in your life that you did not have before. Some of you went to church all your life and never met Jesus. Now, Israel sinned, and I, and I went through a, a historical thing last week, but Israel the sons of Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, divided the kingdom through a process of a, a, a civil war. And the nation was divided into basically the southern kingdom was known as Judah. And then the other tribes formulated what was known as Israel. Basically, they both backslid, which Israel was very good at. And uh, when you read the Bible, you will find out that Israel spent more time in a place contrary to the will of God than they did in a place that was in agreement with the will of God. Well, finally, after God appealed to them through prophet after prophet, he released a massive invasion from the Assyrian Empire in the north. And as I told you last week, that's where we get the stories, the accounts of Jonah, Nineveh, etc. And then a Babylonian invasion to the south where we get the accounts of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, the sweeping away of, of those Israelites. You say, well, what's so important about this? Well, for a period of time, they allowed the Babylonian Empire, allowed Jerusalem to kind of stay somewhat intact. And then there was kind of an insurrection that occurred against Nebuchadnezzar, and he sent his armies back in. And when he did that, he literally leveled everything that had to do with Jerusalem. There basically was virtually not one stone standing upon another. They tore the walls down. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city. They burnt the gates. It was a massive invasion, and he did nothing to rebuild anything. So when we get to the accounts in Nehemiah, we realize there had been this ruination of the city of Jerusalem, and it had laid in waste for 140 years approximately 140 years, 140 years. In Nehemiah 2.18, if you'd go there with me. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So now, 140 years has gone by, 
And the nation, the city, the walls, the gates have all laid in waste for 140 years. In that era, you could not have a strong city without strong walls. You could not have a strong city without fortified gates. And so basically, Jerusalem had no ability to become a prosperous or successful city because it did not have walls and it did not have gates. Now, why were the walls important? Well, they provided protection, but they also provided the ability for watchmen to stand upon the walls and could see an adversary coming from afar off. Now, I know all this is historical, and I pray I'm not boring you too badly, but I want you to get this perspective. For a hundred, everybody say 140 years. See, for 140 years, these walls laid in waste. And a lot of us, it, even Pastor Gale was inferring to this, a lot of us have dealt with wrong thinking. A lot of us have dealt with circumstances in our life that have gone on and on and on and on and on. And basically, the walls of our life have been in ruin. Now, we're not going to have a productive walk with God, and we're not going to have a productive life if we don't get into a protected, fortified place spiritually. The walls of our Christianity, in many cases, need and have to be restored. Now, stay with me on this. So then, in Nehemiah 6.15... I'm, just, I'm going back over this very quickly. In Nehemiah 6.15, it said, So the wall was finished. The wall was finished. And in the 20 and 50th day of the month, in 52 days. Everybody say 52 days. This mess had existed for 140 years, but when they finally listened to God and listened to the man that God sent to them in 52 days, they built back and restored what had laid in waste for 140 years. I declare to you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that some of your long-term messes can be fixed a whole lot quicker than you believe. The enemy has worked against many of you mentally, physically, financially, relationally, and you look back over decades and generations of almost curses that have been upon your bloodline and your family, and it's like there has been a lane of waste in these walls in your life. And God is wanting me to say to you, if he could rebuild the walls under Nehemiah that had been broken down for 140 years in 52 days, how much can God do in the next 52 days of your life? We're always equating how long the mess has been there to determine how long it will take to fix the mess. I got news for you. You can work your whole life and look at it and say, I've done nothing over the last 30 years but create problems and ruination. And God can look down out of heaven at you and say, why don't you give me the next 52 days and watch what I could do in your life if you will lift your eyes up to the hills from whence cometh your help because your help cometh from the Lord which made the heavens and the earth. We have lived our lives thinking, that what has been a mess cannot be restored and I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar and whatever the enemy has meant for evil God will turn it to good and I may be getting ahead of myself but he is getting ready to reverse the curse in many of your lives the physical curses the mental things the financial things it's time for God's people to come up to come out and to enter into their position of destiny. People just accepted God's got a date on the calendar. That's the day he's coming back and uh, praise the Lord. No matter what happens, happens. No. 
God's not coming back after a church with broken down walls. He's not coming after a church with burn up gates. He's not coming after a church with uh, the powers of the enemy uh, tearing down the altars. That's not what he's coming after. He's coming after a radiant, glorious group of sons and daughters of God that when the enemy looks at them, he realizes cancer could not defeat them. They were healed and now they are healthy. He realizes all the things he hurled at them mentally could not defeat them, but they've had their joy restored. All the attacks financially could not put them under. God restored their possessions, restored years to their life, renewed their youth like the eagle. I don't know about you, but I am about ready to see God step on planet earth like he hasn't done and people that have mocked him, that have ridiculed him, that have put him down on the television, in the papers, uh, in all the different places, their knees are going to begin to bend uh, because they're going to see the God of miracles is not dead. Those women on that view show attacking our vice president because he's a true Christian. I just have one question. This is politically incorrect. I wonder if he would have been Islamic and they would have said what they said about his Islamic faith if there wouldn't have been a whole bunch of people in the unemployment line. But it's okay to ridicule a man who loves God. It's okay to ridicule ridicule hundreds of thousands and millions of people in America who profess a born-again, spirit-filled walk with God. That's okay. That's what's happening in our nation. But you want to know something? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where the power of the enemy and the antichrist rises up, you better get ready. If they're going to bring out the big guns, God's going to bring out the nuclear weapons uh, because he has a way of turning things around. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I don't know when the church is going to wake up and rise up again and say we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is not the will of God for us to be passively heads bowed, hand, backs bent over like we are some inferior species. Greater is he that is in us that is in the world. Greater is our God. We bring hope. We bring love. We bring peace. We bring life. We are the redeemed of the Lord. Oh, come on and help me. There's going to be a righteous indignation that is going to rise up in this nation. And I've got news for you from heaven. He is coming back after a restoration revival. And it is getting closer than you think. All right, I gotta gotta move on here. Oh, I mean, there's some preachers gonna get a righteous indignation, and the cowards we've had in the pulpit, I believe God's gonna begin to replace them or transform them to where they begin to preach like men of God instead of like sissified, whatever. I can't even, Aaron said he couldn't put it into words what he saw over there. Some things I just can't put into words. But this weak spirit that has been in our pulpit needs to change. Martin Luther King had no problem standing in the pulpits of America and making America face the sin of racism and making America face that their silence was just as evil as their, uh, as their racist actions. He had no problem having the backbone to stand at a sacred desk and declare this is what God wants to see happen. We need some men of all colors, of all backgrounds, of all races, of all cultures that dare to stand up and let the voice of God sound like a trumpet and let the power of the Holy Ghost hit like a hammer. All right, all right. Zechariah 9, 12. Zechariah 9, 12. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render 
double. And that word render means restore double unto thee. But what's it saying? To have the double, you have to return to the stronghold, which is in essence a fortress city. So he's saying, I want you to return to the place that is fortified, that the walls are strong, that the gates are secure. And if you will return as a prisoner of hope, how many are a prisoner of hope? Lord knows every week I'm a prisoner of hope. Faith is the substance. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know what keeps me in lockstep with the Holy Spirit is I am a prisoner of hope. I am believing for restoration revival. I'm a prisoner of hope. No matter what the accounting department tells me they are going to be needed to pay the bills, I've got to hope and believe that God's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I am a prisoner of hope, and I refuse to reside outside the place of fortified walls and fortified gates. Hmm. Isaiah 60, 18 said, Thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Then he says, Enter, Psalm 100, 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now I want to talk about some gates. Everybody with me? Last week I hit real strong on the, on the um, walls. And the walls created the first phase of protection, but they was not the only phase of protection. Obviously, the watchmen. And so for a city to be secure from their adversaries, they had to have watchmen on the walls, and they had to have strong walls. And the Bible says that these walls are our salvation, and then our gates are praise and how many understand that praise activates the presence of God? Now, when they began the process of rebuilding the walls, they had 10 gates. Everybody say 10. 10 gates that had to be restored. And uh, so my wife was writing these, the names of these gates down as some of you. So as I, as I move through this, but if you can kind of move quickly with me up there, and then we'll go back to each gate separately. You guys with me? All right. There was the sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the refuse gate, the fountain gate, the horse, uh, the, the fountain gate, the water gate, or the gate of water, whatever, the water gate, the horse gate, the east gate, and the inspection gate. Now, when you, uh, when you study this, you'll understand that Israel or the city of Jerusalem, the wall was built, and it was kind of, it wasn't round. <clears throat> I was looking at the map, but it was almost kind of had the shape of a potato, if you want to be uh, visual about it. But around this circular oval-shaped city, there were 10 gates. Now, Say, what's so important about this? Well, if you build a city with fortified walls but no gates, it becomes a prison. So there had to be a way to enter and exit. And how many understand there's an importance to understand here that God is moving constantly. He's bringing things into your life. He's also causing things to exit from your life. There is a going in and there is a coming out. You with me? So doors are not just used to keep things out or gates were not just built to keep things out. They were also built to allow things in. God didn't create the walls to be a prison, but he created 10 gates into Jerusalem to give access to the city and each of these gates had natural significance but I want to try to very quickly show you something about their spiritual significance. The first gate, uh, the first gate, that, and the reason we're going in this sequence is this is the sequence that these gates were restored. 
I don't think there's anything in the Holy Writ that is by accident. And I don't think there's anything that God organizes or does that is by accident. God could have caused him to start anywhere. But it's interesting that the first gate that was restored was the sheep gate. Now, this is where the lambs would be brought for inspection before they were taken to be sacrificed. Are you with me? This is the place where the lambs were brought for inspection before they were taken to be sacrificed. We understand as Christians that everything about our relationship with God and God's access into our life begins with the shed blood of the lamb. Amen? I don't care what new age kind of teachings are out there. We were sinners that needed a savior. So therefore, we needed the lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. We understand that our lamb was inspected. We understand he was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. When we take it into the historical context, every person that brought a lamb for its blood to be shed at the temple to where their sin could be covered before their evils could be dealt with had to come through the sheep gate. So when you look at it, God was authorizing something, said the first thing that I want to do with these access points is create the opportunity again for the blood to be shed to where covering can be upon my people's life. Everything about your walk with God begins with the sacrifice of Christ. Everything about your walk with God begins with Jesus standing at the gate and knocking and saying, if any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Are you glad when you heard him knocking that you opened the door or you opened the gate? We don't slam the gate shut to the lamb. We open the gate wide. We just don't stop him from being who he is. We let him be everything that he has been destined to be. But the first thing that we know him to be, and he has to be is the savior that died for the remission of sin so then there was the fish gate the second gate now the gates are all access places some for entrance some for exit so the fish gate was the closest gate to the fish market and through this gate the fishermen would bring their catch so there was a reason for the gate its location but it's the second gate that was built, and I want you to see prophetic significance in this gate. The first gate, in my opinion, was prophetically speaking of the lamb. The second gate is the fish gate. Jesus looked at these disciples and said, I will make you fishers of men. So the first access that has to happen in our life is the access of the blood, the sacrifice. The second is the spirit of a spiritual fisherman. We've got to understand that God did not just save us to get us to heaven. He saved us and he has put a spirit of evangelism in us. So when that gate opens up, there's a going in and a coming out. There's a going out to see the lost saved and the prodigal restored. There's a coming in with the catch. And so God is going to send you forth to the north, south, east, and go into all nations. Go into India and preach the gospel to every living creature. Terry Savelle will be here next Sunday. Her, her vision is for France. And you say, well, that's, you know, that's not some rugged. Uh, no, France has under 1% people in its nation that are born again. And under 5% that even profess any form of Christianity, Catholicism, or whatever. But we have 95 plus percent of a nation that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. There are more professed atheists in France than there are believers. Well, we're going to have to take the gospel into France. We have to take the gospel into the Isles of the Caribbean. We have to take the gospel into Asia. We have to take the gospel into the European 
cities. But what God says first, your first access point has to be the receiving of me as Lord and Savior, the receiving of the power of my blood. The second one is that you have to allow the spirit of evangelism to be upon your spirit, and then you have to go forth. So you are drawn in to be radically changed to thinking beyond yourself, and you go forth to preach the gospel. Oh, somebody help me. I need you to pull up Jeremiah 6, 16, and 17 in the NIV in just a moment. I'll need it. Third gate, the third one that was restored was called the old gate. Everybody say old gate. And I don't uh, attach any, uh, any personal affinity to this gate. Uh, the old gate. Uh, obviously, Jerusalem developed in a lot of different stages, and it was like any other city. It just didn't begin as a particular size city. The old gate, according to history, was one of what they call one of the original gates. It was when they built its original walls and began to form the original development of the city. The old gate was one of the original gates. So now we've seen the place of sacrifice. Now we've seen the place of evangelism. Now we go to the old gate. Do you have Jeremiah 16 and 17, the NIV for me? Okay, I'll go to Jeremiah 6. Turn there with me if you have your Bibles. You can get there quicker than I can. Is it up there? Okay, thank you. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Isn't that an interesting statement? We're all about everything being new. You know, what's the new trendy way to do this? What's the new and improved version? I am so tired of going to the store and I've got to look at 53 different versions of Oreos. <laughs> How many like Oreos? Oh, come on, let me see. Is anybody out there besides me like, you know, the two little things with the cream filling in the middle? How many like Oreos? All I want is a bag of original Oreos. Do you know what I'm talking about? But you've got to weed through 14 others. You just can't go buy soap for your dishwasher anymore. You've got to weed through 14 versions of what you want. Because we're all about the new and improved. How do you improve on an Oreo? I mean, how do you improve on an original Hershey bar? I mean, if you just, I mean, Godiva's great and all of them are wonderful, but there's just something, come on, women, you know what I'm talking about. The ladies ought to get on this. There's just something about a good old-fashioned, plain, no nuts in it, just just a plain old Hershey bar. Oh, but bless God, we got to mess with that too. You can't just find Coke. No, we got to have the new improved. We got to have zero. We got to have Coke half. We got to have Coke three quarters. We got to have Coke with mango. We got to have Coke with, you know, the new tall diet ones that got all sorts of weird stuff in them. Come on. that You can't improve on the original. There's nothing better. Even if you're a Pepsi fan, God help you. Even if you're a Pepsi fan, there's nothing better than a good old fashioned original Coke. I don't need no mango juice in it. I don't need the sugar taken out of it. Praise God. Pour some more sugar in it. It's a Coca-Cola. I rebuke that thing. Oh, I got to get back to the scripture here. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. So what's he saying? Ask for the old path, which is the good path. And walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said we will not walk in it. Go to the 17th verse. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet, but you said we will not listen. See, God's trying to say here now, now the third gate that was restored was the old gate. I'm trying to say something to you, 
uh, sons and daughters of Jerusalem. You also have to understand there are some ancient paths that are good. And those good ancient paths will bring peace and will bring rest. Some of you are trying to find it in the new improved version of Christianity. But some of you need to understand something. There is no need to improve it. It was great right from the start. The original day the church began with a bunch of Holy Ghost filled, blood washed apostles and men and women of God. You can't improve on one old fisherman walking out and declaring in a short sermon and seeing over 3,000 souls get how do you make it better when the dead are being raised demon possessed are being delivered cripples are walking blind eyes are opening deaf ears how do you improve on that Oh, we needed all this to reach. No, 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 no. In two and a half years' time, all of Asia heard the gospel. Didn't have a printing press. They didn't have a microphone. They didn't have a television camera. They didn't have social media. They didn't have any of it. They just rose up, and the power of the Holy Ghost was all about. And when the sick start getting healed, the bound start getting delivered, the dead start getting raised, you know what happens? People People are drawn to it. Said that the ancient paths are good and they bring peace and rest. I've said this to you many times. My father in law told me in the first couple of years of Galen's and my marriage, he said, Tim, it's not always the most convenient, but the best way through life is just doing it God's way. Now, I, I, I want you to hear me on this because you say, well, that, this Old Testament scripture. Well, let's just take it into the gospel. Do you realize the gospel got started? It's 2,000 plus years old. It's old. We call it the New Testament, but it's still old. So it's the Old New Testament and it's still good and it still brings rest and it still brings peace and what men have tried to do, they have tampered with things that have been in such a place of perfection that they never need to be touched ever. How do you improve on the blood-bought sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary? Yes, it is an old gate, but I'm telling you something, it brings peace and it brings rest. Quit trying to make something cute that was never designed to be cute. It was designed to be lasting. And the fourth gate he commanded to be built, you still with me? Was the valley gate. Now the valley gate opened to the valley of Hinnon, H-I-N-N-O-N. And it opened to this valley, and you're going to, in the next gate, I'll explain some things more about this valley. But it opened to a valley. And what you have to understand is there's going to be hills and there's going to be valleys. And so we start with the sacrifice. We move forward with the spirit of not just getting saved and going to heaven, but becoming fishers of men. Then we stick to the old paths, which there is peace and rest. And then we come to this gate that was the fourth one to be built, which is the gate called the valley gate. How many have had some valleys? Let's put it in a more contemporary term. The old school folks called them valleys. You ever hear Dottie Rambo? Yeah, see, she's years ago. She wrote a whole lot of songs. But I remember as a kid listening to her, she wrote a song that says, This is my valley. I will not complain. I hated that song. 
Because the next lyric goes, I know it's good for me <laughs> to suffer some things. I can't remember what the lyrics are now. <laughs> to suffer and pain. I know there was pain in it. <laughs> this is my. I didn't want a valley. <laughs> this is my, you know, she wrote another song. It's called One More River to Cross and One More Mountain to Climb. One more valley that I got to go. Now, I like that song. I like crossing that river and climbing that mountain and getting through that valley. But I didn't like anything that attached me to a valley or a low place. Have you ever had a low place? Well, you've got to understand that sometimes the only way God can get through to you is in the valley. Yea, though I walk through. God doesn't design us to live in the valley, but he does design at different times us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil in that valley. Why? Because thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So your weaponry and your miraculous weapons of warfare, I will not fear. You're with me, and your weapons are with me. But the valley itself, the valley itself is a place for God's presence to access you and develop a humbling. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Pride and arrogance will keep you from breakthroughs quicker than anything. Because your pride and your arrogance will tell you you can fix it. And I got news for you, there's a lot of stuff you can't fix. God has reserved those fix-it moments for himself. But then you have the refuse gate, and that is a polite way of changing it from the dung gate. And I'm not going into that in definition. But the refuse gate was the fifth gate to be built, and it was the next gate, and it was adjacent to, to the valley gate. Now, it's interesting because the place of refuse, or this was the place where the refuse and the rubbish was removed. And it's interesting, it was taken to the valley of Hinnon, which is the same valley that the valley gate faced. So what did they do? They removed all the junk and they took it to the valley and they burn it. Hang with me. In your moments of the low place, God is also removing the rubbish. Now the dung gate or the refuse gate was not built primarily to bring junk in. It was created to get junk out. And you've got to understand something. Every one of us have to have a place of removal of things, but that same place cannot be the place of the receiving of refuse. I'm not going to get crude, so stay. Don't, you don't have to hold your breath. Too many of God's people are bringing garbage in instead of getting garbage out. So when you hit... This will be good if you'll get it. When you hit your valley gate, you are also simultaneously carrying out the rubbish. Because when you get humble, God has a way of getting out of you what needs to be brought out and burning it with fire. You know what he talked about? The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. It talked about that through the spirit we do mortify the deeds of the flesh. So what am I getting at? There is a place that God has designed to remove the rubbish of your lust of the flesh, your lust of the eye, your pride of life. And what has to happen? It has to be burn out. How does it get burn out? It gets burn out as you yield in a greater way to the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you just think it's a mind over matter thing. It is not. There are some things that will never be exterminated out of your life unless God humbles you, then he removes it, and then he burns it. He just doesn't set it out there. 
No, no, you're not listening to me. He just doesn't set it out there to draw flies and birds like we do at our, what, what do they call those things where we dump our trash? The dump, thank you. There's another fancier word for that. Landfill, praise God. Now, it's not a dump, it's a landfill. But if you ever notice around landfills, there's all this rubbish and there's all these birds flying around and you know there's flies and all sorts of smells and it's a horrible, it's not a place you want to go to before you go out to dinner or something. But what they didn't do it that way back then. They took that junk out and they burn it. God's not about collecting your garbage. God is about burning your garbage up. Now, the next gate, the sixth gate, I'm on the home stretch. You don't realize it. I'm over halfway there, is the fountain gate. And the fountain gate was near the pool of Shiloh, which is a place where people cleanse before going to the temple. There has to be, in the fortifications of our life, there has to be a discipline of cleansing ourselves with the washing of water by the word. So in the city of Jerusalem, there was this pool, and this pool was in the route that people would go to the temple. And so as they would go by this pool, they would cleanse themselves before they went to the temple. How many believe that there has to be, there is the cleansing of the blood that delivers us from the power of sin, but how many know there's also the washing of the word? And the washing of the word is what cleanses us from the daily defilements we get in. There is no power that can deliver you from the power of sin or the dominion of sin but the blood of the Lamb. But then there is that day. How many of you have messed up since you've been saved? Now, I want to see your hands. I'm taking a survey. I'm going to send it to CNN. Okay, I see. How many have done a really excellent, outstanding job if you do lift up both hands? Okay, now... Does that mean that you have been kicked out of the kingdom of God? Does that mean you no longer have Abba Father? Does that mean Jesus? No, that doesn't mean any of that because you've been delivered from sin, but there's been a day-to-day defilement. How do you deal with that? You have to take the soap and the water of the word of God and apply it to your life. Pastor Gail would say, bringing every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. That is a cleansing word that commands us to keep our thinking in check. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ. So we start declaring it. Now we have the mind of Christ. We start declaring it. What does that do? That cleanses us from a carnal mind and activates a spiritual mind. Then you go to the water gate. It's the seventh place of access and the seventh gate that was restored. And it led to the Gidron Springs. So now, again, you're seeing there are some of these gates that have to do with entrance and some of them that have to do with exit. So now people would leave through the water gate and it took them straight to the Gidron Springs. And that was a place of refreshing. And so in the realms of the access to your life, there has to be a place of deliverance from sin. There has to be a place that God propels you to evangelism. There has to be a place that keeps you in the old paths that are good for peace and for rest. Are you hearing me? Then there has to be a place that you deal with the humbling of the valley and a place that deals with the burning up of the rubbish. Then there's a place of cleansing of the daily defilement and then there is has to be a place of refreshing and some of us have forgotten how to get refreshed man when you come into church the first thing you ought to be thinking about I'm going to get refreshed man I'm going to throw some water on my face you know what I found out and Pastor Aaron travels uh, all over the world and takes these long long trips you know, I, I, I say there is a limit to how far you can tra- allow legally to travel, at least for me. Brazil is as far as it gets. I took one trip to South Africa, 18 hours one way out of New York City, Johannesburg. I said, this is not God. <laughs> and I was in first class. And they even made me a bed, gave me a pillow. 
But after I laid down and slept eight hours, I watched my big fat Greek wedding three times. I did crossword puzzles. I read. I ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and there were still four hours left. I said, God, if I ever get on this plane, the only plane I'm getting on is get me back, and the trip home took longer because we're going against the wind. But, you know, I found something about long trips. Sometimes if I could just get a shower, Almost forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Say, now why did, I, why did I get on a trip to South Africa here? I, there's a reason for that. But sometimes you hit the ground and you're trying not to be completely out of sync so you want to stay up to get back on the time zone you live in. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I will not lay down. I will just get into a shower. And I will, I'll heat it up. I'll cool it down. I'll wash my hair. Uh, I'll, I'll rinse my hair. I'll put some conditioner on, rinse it out, stand there, change the temperatures. But what ends up happening, that water brings refreshing and it buys me a few more hours to get my body laying down, laying down at a time that is more appropriate to where now I am at. And you know, a lot of us have forgotten how to refresh ourselves. Some of you come into church and you look like you have just been on an 18 hour flight to Johannesburg. You've got to learn how to refresh yourself. Some of you come in and it looks like you didn't get a day off. And I'm talking about you just worked all day, every day. And then you somehow, by an act of God, drug yourself. It's like you got your hand and you're bringing yourself in. And when they sing the oh, oh, oh song, you're saying, oh, God, don't sing that because they'll think I'm going to jump. I need to lay down. I, I, I need to sit down. I need to curl up in the fetal position. You've got to learn how to refresh yourself. You've got to find your Gidron Springs. You've got to find that place that you say, God, I'm walking through this gate and I'm going to find a refreshing. How do you refresh yourself? The Bible says when you speak in an unknown tongue, you edify yourself. How do you refresh yourself? You begin to praise the Lord because God inhabits praise. How do you refresh yourself? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. I know it's not easy but it's not mind over matter. It is a determination in your spirit uh, that you're going to get to the place that God has called you to get and that water gate led them straight to the place of refreshing. I'm almost done. Stay with me. These, are, these last couple are fun. Well, three. Lord, help me. How many let me finish this? Are you sure? Okay, because the last three are really good. The horse gate. Yeah, the secretariat, the sea biscuit gate. The horse gate was the closest to the king's stables. It was the place where men would ride out. Remember, some of these gates were for exiting, some of them more for entering. But they exited to go to war. So the horse gate was the eighth gate that was restored. There has to be something that rises up inside of you that you are willing to go after the enemy. And there's a watchman up on the wall. And the watchman may have said there's an enemy approaching. And they would saddle up the horses near the king's stable. And they would ride out through the horse gate. And when the, the women and the children and the elderly would see those men on their horses riding out, faith would rise up in them to say our army is going out to fight for us. Our army is going out to defend us. I got news for you. There needs to be something about the sons and daughters of God that gives hope to the weak, that gives hope to the sick, that gives hope to people that are under an oppression of the enemy, that you are saying in and of yourself, I am going out to wage war. There needs to be husbands that are saying, I'm going to the place of prayer. I'm going to wage war against the enemy for my family. There needs to be more wives that shut the prayer closet door and says, I'm interceding for my children and my grandchildren. What are you doing? You are going through the horse gate. 
you are saying, I'm going to wage war against the powers of the enemy. The ninth gate is the east gate, and the east gate faced the Mount of Olives. So now we've seen the spirit of warfare at the horse gate, but now we see the spirit of expectation at the east gate, because the east gate faces the Mount of Olives, which if you know prophecy, the Lord will return and put his feet upon the Mount of Olives. There has to be a moment in your life that you've got more than just a hopeless perspective, but that you have a supernatural expectation. I have to have an east gate. I've got to be able to look out and see the foot of my Savior coming back to this earth. It gives me hope to keep fighting the battle. And the last gate, the tenth gate, is the inspection gate. And it was the place, it was the tenth gate that was restored, but it was the place where in Jerusalem's development, David inspected his troops before they went out to battle. And if there is a troop inspection, that means there could be a troop correction. And the tenth gate is, are you willing to stand in the gate and let him inspect you? Are you willing, before you go out to do whatever you feel commissioned to do, to have the king say your armor isn't properly in place. To have the king saying, it doesn't look like you're ready to fight this battle. This needs to be adjusted. This needs to be corrected. Are you willing to be inspected? Which means you have to submit. You have to submit. Because if the king says, I know you're wanting to go, but you're not ready to go, Will you deal with what you have to deal with to have more than want, but have readiness? And so the 10th gate was the place of examination, the place of inspection. As a pastor, you try to help your people. And I don't know how many times I've had to sit and have people tell me what they're going to do. But yet for years they said, well, we were, were submitted to your ministry. Well, when you're submitted, you submit things and you let them be inspected. Hello. You submit things and you let them be inspected. I learned a long time ago with people that there's a very rarefied few that will receive inspection and correction. But in those rarefied few, there are the chosen. Because the chosen will allow covering to inspect and to correct. And I've seen it many, many times through the years. People would submit things and I wouldn't be particularly, the only way I could respond to it because they would come in, well, God told me, God said, God to Carter. Well, now either I tell them they didn't hear from God or I had a better plan than God. I know I didn't have a better plan than God, but my question mark was, did you really hear from God? And many times I would be handcuffed to help people because there was no coming to the gate for inspection. It was just coming to the gate to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And you know something? God put watchmen on the walls to see afar off. And they said, did you hear the trumpet? But they wouldn't listen to the trumpet. And the Lord compares the trumpet to the cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgressions, the house of Jacob their sins. There's more to the sound of the trumpet than just to give you a hot flash and a cold chill and a euphoric feeling. There's many times the sound of the trumpet says there's an inspection and there needs to be a correction. And that's what people struggle with nowadays because nobody is going to tell anybody how to do anything because we're all on our own path. But you know what? I, I, I'm, I guess I just like those old ancient paths 
that are good and they lead to rest and to peace. When I have listened to the voices that God put in my life that were older spiritually than me and they inspected and they corrected, <clears throat> it helped me have life and have peace. And when I've done my own thing and ignored them, I found out there was a way that seemed right, but there, there was a way that was right. I hope somebody got something out of this. Ten gates, they're all places of entrance and exit. But all of them, if you look back at them, speak very loudly to you. Next Sunday, I'm going to preach on the restoring of the 12 stones of the altars of your life. And always remember this before I get to next Sunday, that after the 12 stones were restored, fire fell from heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I'm ready for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. If you're watching online today, I send the word to you right now. I declare the 10 gates of your life that you will acknowledge. I declare the 10 gates in your life. I declare that the power of the sheep gate, I declare the power of the fish gate, I declare the power of the old gate, I declare the power of the valley gate and the refuse gate. I declare the power of the water gate and the fountain gate. I declare the power of the inspection gate, the east gate. I declare the power of all of these gates will begin to impact your life. I declare every burden be removed and every yoke be destroyed. If you're in the room with me, stand to your feet all across the house. I declare that upon your lives right now, Maybe as I preached on some of these things, you're looking at it and you're saying, God, things aren't where they should be. See, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of God is peace and righteousness and joy. Peace should be upon your thoughts. Order should be in your life and joy should be in your walk. And I want you to lift your hands and I want you to start thanking God for peace and for righteousness and for the joy of the Lord. I declare peace. I declare righteousness. I declare joy. I declare peace and righteousness and joy. I declare the power of the warrior at the horse gate that we will go forth as intercessors. We will go forth as warriors. We will go forth as mighty men and women of God. I declare that a fearful, pacifist spirit will not be in us, but a bold, powerful spirit will rise up for us as we stand in the gap for our family, as we defend our homes, uh, as we defend our finances, as we defend our physical bodies. I declare the power of the warriors. Give us great expectation for the future. In the name of Jesus, I will lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. I have expectancy that the Lord shall return and there will be great victory on earth in the name of Jesus. Give God one more great praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just for just a moment, for 30 seconds or so, just lift your hands up. Just start thanking God. Just start thanking God. Lord, we worship you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. In him I live and move and have my being. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. How many are glad you've been in the house of God today? Glory to God.